Oh, I think uh, the importance of, of LGBT History Month is um, is one of huge significance, not only to me, but I believe to um, but I believe to everybody because I feel that we are living in a time at the moment where I think if you don't keep talking about things, if you don't keep things relevant, then what people have fought for in the past and the rights people have fought for um, will end up just flipping around and going back to what what they used to be. So it's a, it's, it's a time when um, we feel it's almost a safe space to be able to engage with people around issues to do with LGBT um, and also around creating better environments. So keep evolving, keep it moving forward rather than just stay where we are. Because people might feel that, that, that people um, have maybe within the LGBT community enough rights at the moment um, or kind of, you know, enough things being spoken about them. But the reality is, is that you know, the fact that we, we still fight for equality means, you know, equality is a level playing field. And people understand that the LGBT community is still fighting for equality. So the reality is we have to keep evolving. We have to keep moving forward to be able to get to the point where we finally feel like we do have equality. Uh, well, February is is an important month um, as far as LGBT history is concerned because it was it was the abolition of Section um, twenty eight, and what it enables us to do is to pay tribute to the people of the past um, who fought to be able to get writers to be able to open other people's minds to what it is like living LGBT within within schooling. Um, and also it was it was a year when uh, you know section 28 was abolished and it was the law which which kind of stopped teachers being able to promote the acceptability of homosexuality as a pretended family relationship as as they call it. And that was only abolished in 2003, which you know isn't isn't that long ago. Um, and I, you know, I, I believe it's 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 such a significant month um, for that. Um, and if we didn't celebrate it in the way we were allowed to now, then everything people fought for in the past kind of would have been um, in vain. Because we need to keep highlighting what we fought for in February, um, so people realise the importance of. Of, of what we are, are allowed now to teach our children, which to many people might seem very normal. But when you think back to 2003, you know, a conservative government um, didn't allow it, um, or it was brought in in 1988, I think, and it was abolished in 2003. So for that period of time, it was never allowed. And there's a section of society who were schooling or reading in that period of time between 88 and, 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 and 03, um, that kind of never had that opportunity. So might, you know, through lack of education, through lack of knowledge, have a source of discrimination. So February, you know, is such a relevant moment for when people thought to break that and also to get people to realise, you know, what February is about. It's not just a month that's picked out of the of the sky is something we feel, you know, February sounds like a good month. Nobody's got anything to do under February. I know, let's make it LGBT History Month. If that, that isn't the reason. It's a very relevant, very poignant moment in, in, in our history. I, I feel since the abolition of, of, of Section 28, I feel I feel things things have moved on, but I think things have only moved on in certain areas where people have almost forced that change or that change has been welcomed. I do believe that, you know, there's so many people who could be listening to this that have no idea why, you know, February is so relevant or um, uh, have no idea of the changes that have happened um, since, since the abolition of it. So I feel, um, I, I, I feel the important, the, the importance of it 
and the fact that some people feel that we've 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 already moved on um is 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 really relevant for us to make sure um that the people who don't know the importance of it the people who don't actually feel like we've moved on and the people who are in worse case scenarios and yet you know we celebrated this in the UK or we mark in this month in the UK but i believe a lot of people who who live and myself like who kind of passionately campaign within um the community realize that within the UK in certain cities um you can live a happily gay lifestyle in london you can have gay friends go to a gay cafe gay bar gay gym and be welcomed for your authenticity and all of them not everywhere in london but then you come to you know other places in the uk where that is love and you look at a bigger picture you look at the world and you look at you know this accept your country still in the world where it's illegal um to be gay so you know uh, i feel we've come on a certain extent but the reality is is when you look at the bigger picture you know we can look at a very small picture and say that things are fine in a very small picture and through a very a one dimensional lens but when you look at it through a bigger lens and through a bigger picture then you realize that um there is still so so much to be get, to be done that people are either ignorant to or people just don't know it exists because it doesn't affect them but the reality is is that you know there's a lot of there's a lot still of discrimination um there's a lot of atrocities um there's a lot of kind of you know stories of genocide of the lgbt community and that is still happening in 2020 so as far as we like to believe we've come um there's still a long long way to go uh, my experience has been has been one that you know is is mainly unbelievably unbelievably positive but unbelievably positive in a way that i felt for me coming out I, I I kind of took control of my own narrative if you like um and I stopped really caring too much about what other people thought about me so you know I I I I I faced discrimination I faced abuse there's times when I need to assess a situation before I walk in it um and a lot of them I shouldn't have to but that's the reality of the world we live in but I I believe that um I believe that what it did for me and my own authenticity and my own personal strength and that I could almost deal with that discrimination I didn't like it I could almost deal with it but I, it, it, on the whole I feel people whether they whether they like me for my ability whether they kind of respect me because of my talking about my sexuality I feel that the honesty about speaking about something that makes you quite vulnerable whether people like it or dislike it they can't help but respect it so i feel for me personally it's 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 been you know it's kind of been a great weight that was lifted um off my shoulders and um a great sense of also understanding who my real friends are um who my real colleagues are and um who really respects me for you know what my personality who really respects me for my ability rather than just you know people um disliking me for for my sexuality. Um I think being a role model is 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 and can be very difficult because I think when you become a role model and if I've become a role model it definitely wasn't kind of through choice. Um I feel it was through realizing first and foremost I came out about my sexuality for me to be able, and, and people who were close to me and then i think kind of you realize if you have some kind of a pub, public platform um especially within sport and you do something that could be deemed as something that's quite championing then then you take on the mantle of of um of being a role model and that can be quite a pressured situation because i think people then feel like they judge your every move move and everything you make and the reality is as i've always said to people is that you know i am far from perfect i do things wrong i admit to doing things wrong and people think that role models means that they have to do things right all the time but i don't believe that i think it's people role models are people who live real lives and 
you know, are quite open about the fact that they do things wrong or open about the fact that they get hurt by things um, a lot because that engages more with 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 the reality of of how other people um, of how other people are, are, are feeling. So um, for me, it, it, it's it's something that I in time. I've learned to realise and has have learned to understand that you know me coming out as gay was a headline, and the legacy that I want to leave behind as more of a role model is not me coming out as gay, but me doing what I did after I came out as gay. So you know the the understanding that I continued to play rugby, I continued to fight. I I, I very much feel like and my family say to me sometimes, why don't you just sit down? enjoy the life that you've created for yourself but I feel that that would be a very selfish trade for me so I want to continue fighting to help other people be able to have the life that I'm you know I feel, feel very blessed to have and that kind of my version of of being um, of being a role model is I continue to try to do things good sometimes failing you know sometimes being unsuccessful but always you know, kind of discussing that, always talking about that, not just talking about, you know, the things that I'm good at or the things that I'm successful at, because that doesn't make somebody a role model. That kind of makes somebody um, very false. And I think a role model is somebody who needs to be very real. Um, so that's how I've kind of taken on the mantle, if people want to call it a role model. So the thought process behind um, doing my first um, ever Ironman was when I wanted to announce through external pressure of the media and um, release it, trying trying to get the story out before me about me living with with HIV. Is what what I sat down one day and I thought about is that you know as a sports person in rugby, for instance, with me, I there's, there's two different types. There was two different types of learning always within the room. Um, and one version of learning was kind of verbally people could take on instructions and put a, you know kind of absorb a thought process it and be able to do it and then some people could only learn by kind of visually seeing and and being visually taught so what I decided is when I made decided to make uh, when I was forced to make the documentary about um, me being open about living with HIV is I wanted to verbally give as much information to people as I possibly could about what it is to live with HIV um, in 2020. Um, and there was a lot of information to give. And I felt a lot of it was to try and break down stigmas that people had thought of in the past. And I remember sitting there one day thinking, somebody had said to me a while ago to kind of visualize um, the limitations of living with HIV. Then I'd say, you know, there's somebody who couldn't really be physically active. What I decided to do then was within the documentary, as well as giving people all this verbal information, take on what would have been something that would have never, ever been on my radar and ask to do something that um, would have been or was, without a shadow of a doubt, the most physically demanding challenge that probably any human being on this planet um, could undertake. And I felt, what a great way of doing it would be doing it in um, in an Ironman in Kempi in Wales, which is literally down the road um, from where I live. One of the most demanding Ironman courses. I just thought it's 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 making yourself quite vulnerable as well to a big crowd of people who have come to watch. So not just being not just being kind of physically um, vulnerable because you're so tired also being quite mentally vulnerable because yeah, I understood that the crowd would have realised that I'm doing this to kind of raise awareness for HIV and I wondered how they would react. So for me, it was that process of being able to show people that physically living with HIV in 2020 doesn't limit my physical abilities. In fact, what it did, it broadened them and it gave me a reason to want to be healthier. It gave me a reason to want to push my body even further showing people that I had the capabilities to move my body um, even further. I 
you know what? I, I suppose it was one of the craziest days of my entire life in so many ways. Like, there's so many adjectives I could use to describe that day, um, both one, one up there and, and some down here as well. Um, but for me, you know, it was... Uh, it was uh, really at the start. It was really, uh, I was really nervous because I'd only learned to swim six months previous. Like six months prior to doing swim, I literally couldn't swim. So I, I, I kind of just focused on swimming for for six months. So you know, to go from learning to swim to being in the sea with all these people, um, and realizing whilst I'm swimming constantly that all of a sudden you know the, the news that I'd out on social media the night before would have started to split. So this the swimming in the sea kind of gave me an anonymity that I quite liked. But it was obviously because I'd only learned to swim six months previous to it. And it was it was it was also one of the terrifying, petrifying experiences of my entire um in, in entire life. And I remember coming out of the water and you've got to run about a mile to the to where you change them to get onto the bike. I realized that there was kind of a sense of anticipation of people, people waiting for me. And then when I got on the bike and you started cycling on the bike, obviously you're going, you're going quite fast on the bike or fast enough, you know, not to really gauge people's reactions, but there was areas and points where I felt that um, people, people were quite excited. Um, you know, quite supportive of seeing me. And that gave me like massive courage. Going on, but I love for me the, the most. I don't know. I, I can't really describe this part. The only way I can describe it is um, I remember there was when I got off the bike and I tur- got started started the marathon and I turned to run the first kind of straight and there was this where there's a huge crowd of people and all I can describe it as like I, I can only imagine is somebody like Ed Sheeran or Beyonce walked on stage. And you have like a hundred thousand people, and everybody directs their energy and their support to an individual. And that, when I turned the corner, I remember just hitting this kind of wall of noise, this wall of support that was just team directed at me. And about halfway up the road, about three hundred yards, all my family and my husband were, and I stopped, give my husband a hug, and everybody was going, "Oh, that's lovely, that's so so." But the reason I stopped was because I couldn't breathe out because this, this wave of support, this energy had hit me so much that I literally couldn't. I know this sounds pathetic. I couldn't breathe out because it took my breath away. So I hugged my husband and I was holding him and he would say, you got to go, you got to keep running. And I was like, I can't breathe. I cannot breathe. And then I had to kind of like compose myself. And then I remember as I left him, thinking to myself, right, I have to finish this. I can either run around here now, accept all this lovely um, support I'm getting, um, uh, take it all in, give people high fives, or I could do what I set out to do, and that's finish it. Finish it in the light, because there's kind of there's this challenge of finishing it in the light, you know, opposed to finishing it in the dark. I want to finish it in the light where people can see me, and then my message which is a bigger message than me, bigger message than, you know, me taking on the act, the, the, all, the, all the applause, will have been the best possible message that I could have made it be. So I remember that I just looked at the floor and for four hours, I just focused on, on running, finished the marathon. And then when I crossed the line, um, obviously there's a massive sense of, of elation, but I think more sense of, of, of relief than anything else. Um, relief that I'd finished in the light um, relief that I felt that whatever message I was going to deliver whether people would accept it or not it would be the best possible message uh, that, that I could have had and, and fair play to Ironman they were lovely because they allowed Steve and my husband to be on the finish line to give me my medal and to cross it to see him who'd been on this journey you know with me as well um, and then see all my family and then I, I basically went to bed and I slept for about a week. <laughs> um, I think it's massively important for sport to strive for inclusivity because sport, sport has the platform to educate people 
in a way that no, nothing else can. No other politician, no world leader. You know, people people within sport have have um, has a following and um, have have people's attention like nobody else can. So I think if people within sport continue to be vocal about wanting inclusivity, um, be vocal about accepting inclusivity, and society as a whole will listen and will look and will learn from what sports people say to them because, you know, I don't know, you could, you could have a room of world leaders talking about something and as important as a rule they, they, they feel they're able to create, whatever they try to implement to the public might or might not get through. If you had a room full of world leaders of sports from all different sports and they stood on a platform and, and spoke about inclusivity, I guarantee you millions of people would not just, or billions of people would not just listen, but they would act on their words as well. And that's why sport has such an important part to play in creating better environments in society as well. I think my advice for anybody from the LGBT community who wants to be involved in sport, but is probably feeling a bit nervous um, about getting involved um, in whatever sport um, it is, is to realize that real sports people, you don't have to be professional, I mean real sports people who care about this sport, really only care about people's abilities and people's personalities, not people's sexuality. And I think sometimes as the individual being afraid, you think your sexuality is going to be a big definition of who you are. But if you want to participate in team sport, if you want to participate in individual sport, then people realize that it's your ability that is, is kind of the primary factor, um, not, your, not, not your sexuality. And also what I think being part of sport does, whether it be team sport or individual sport, is it gives you a sense of kind of a, another sense of identity, a sense of friendship, a sense of camaraderie, a sense of team spirit that is very, very difficult to find anywhere else. And being, for me, I understand being, being gay can be a very lonely, sometimes a lonely existence. You know, if you lived somewhere um, that was quite isolated, you decided to move somewhere um, to find a better life for yourself, then you move there and you're kind of on your own. And it's difficult to find friends. It's difficult to find um, um, companions. And a great way of starting friendships, a great way of starting finding companions is, is through sport. Because as much as you, know, you need kind of physical attributes, also you need really good values to be part of a good sporting environment. So um, it's, it's, it's a great way to interact with people while staying fit, while staying active. Um, while staying, staying very healthy as well.